Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Tanya Farrelly. I'm the founder and director of Bray Literary Festival. It's great to see you all here today and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next event which is the Stinging Fly Literary Lecture. Um, this has been something that we've done annually since the beginning of the festival with thanks to Declan Mead and the Stinging Fly. Um, we've had some wonderful writers give it down to the years. Um, we've had Mia Gallagher, we've had Sean O'Reilly, we had Paul Lynch and today we have another wonderful writer. We've got Kevin Power. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Declan, who's going to say a few words and introduce Kevin. Um, I'd just like to thank the Stinging Fly for sponsoring this event. And I'll also just take the opportunity really quickly to thank our other sponsors of the festival. Um, the Arts Council of Ireland, Wicklow County Council, the Open University. You can see a lot of our banners here behind me. Um, one Dublin, one book. We had an event here last night. Uh, Dubray, the People's College, the Irish Writers' Centre, and the Mermaid Arts Centre. So the, the festival couldn't happen without this support and this kind of sponsorship. So that's all for me. I'm going to hand you over to Declan. Uh, thanks very much, Tanya, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, yeah, it's just a great privilege to be here again in Braytown Hall um, after the pandemic and to have this event happen live again. Um, we're delighted to continue the partnership with Bray Literary Festival, and big thanks to David and Tanya and Brian and Anne and all involved in the festival. Um, it's a, you know it's testament to you all um, that this is still happening and that it um, continues to flourish from year to year. So well done to all involved in the festival. Um, yep, yeah, delighted to have Kevin Power here today to give our lecture this year. Um, as many of you will know, Kevin is the author of two novels, Bad Day in Black Rock and White City, um, and a recent book of criticism, The Written World. Um, he is the winner of the 2009 Rooney Prize for Irish Literature, his writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Guardian, The Irish Times, and many other places, including The Stinging Fly. Um, I remember a long time ago, I think it's probably... 2004, 2004 yeah, no, I, <laughs> I didn't know that, uh, that um, we published a story by Kevin, and I, d I remember a phone call with Kevin uh, when we were going through edits, and he was calling me Mr. Mead, Mr. Mead, Mr. Mead, and I didn't... I, didn't, I wasn't used to <laughs> being called Mr. Reed. Then I still am not, <laughs> but uh, it was very memorable, and it was great, you know, memorable story. Um, you know, publishing a, a first story by Kevin, and to watch his career since then, and you know, to welcome him back now to give the annual lecture is um, it's kind of part of the reason why the Sting and Fly exists in order to give these opportunities to writers as they move through their careers. Um, so, yeah, we're very grateful as well to the Arts Council for their support of the Sting and Fly. And as I say, it's great to be back in Bray. So, without further ado, let's hear it for Kevin Power. Hello. Thank you, Declan. I remember that phone call too. I was 22 or 23. And as far as I was concerned, you might as well have been Gordon Lish which you are. Um, thank you all for coming. It's really an honor to be asked to give this lecture and considering my distinguished predecessors, also quite frightening, um, <clears throat> given how superb those lectures are, and you can read them on the Stingy Fly website. Uh, I would just want to say thank you to Declan and to Tom Morris at the Stinging Fly for all their support um, over the years, um, and also to Tanya and David for asking me to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. So my title is Attempted Rescues, Notes on Writing. I grew up in Rathcool, a village in southwest Dublin that nobody has ever heard of. South of Rathcool are the foothills of the Dublin mountains. North of Rathcool is the N7. If you were so inclined, you could say that these geographical boundaries make the village feel like a trap. Many of my Rathcool experiences are numb spots in my memory, patches of zero feeling, as when the dentist freezes half your face to tinker with a molar. In my notebook recently, I wrote, Rathcool, 
you wouldn't go there unless you lived there, and you wouldn't live there unless you had to. When I wrote these words, I was living in Rathcool because I had to. We were moving house and staying with my mother for a month while our new house had its plumbing fixed. Installed aged 40 in my childhood home, I promptly regressed to the age of 15, feeling returned to all the numb places. There I was, writing snide things about Rathcool in my notebook, walking up Stony Lane towards Elm Walk, the old neighborhood, in a state of violent frustration and despair, thinking this is the town of the living dead. It's a nothing place, a purgatorial interzone. Nobody here understands me. Life is elsewhere. When I lived in Rathcool, I was often scared and often angry, though I didn't really know this at the time. I found the other kids in my school often violent, unpredictable. I had no idea how to talk to people. I imagined that the people I could talk to were elsewhere. Behind my secondary school, on a low rise, was a field in which we played football during gym. I remember standing there one gray winter afternoon, looking at the gray sky above the school buildings, and wondering if I would ever get out of there. If the world around me would ever be anything other than gray and populated by people who liked football. Now I was back, the difference being, now I was pushing my kids in their out and about nipper double buggy. My hair was going gray, and I never had to play football or even think about it. I can be ironic about these things in retrospect, about my teenage self, about my unredeemed old feelings. Irony being one of the magic spells that I have used to try to rescue myself from precisely that self, precisely those feelings. The concept of myself as someone who keeps a notebook being another such magic spell, and the concept of myself as a writer being the most powerful magic spell of all. Whenever we write, we negotiate with ourselves. <clears throat> it is often a bloody and intractable negotiation, more like a peace process than a trade deal. This is because we are not united internally. We are many selves, and often those selves have rival needs. Some kind of truce must be established if the work is to get written. Who's in charge today? One of the familiar writing selves, or must we forge a new one for this new piece, this new story, new essay, new novel. Something like this happens every time we begin to write. And the writing self thus negotiated, is it always the same self or is it a new self each time? How could it be? The writing self is not a permanent fixture of the mind or the soul. It's a contingent response to selves and circumstance. Not everyone has thought so. In tradition in the individual talent, T.S. Eliot asserted that, in fact, the poet, the writer, must get the self out of the way entirely in order to liberate and purify the writing. He said what happens, quote, is a continual surrender of himself as he is at the moment to something which is more valuable. The progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice, a continual extinction of personality, end of quote. Whenever I read these words, I think, which self, which personality? Good for Eliot if he only had one. The idea that there is a single indivisible self which can be shoved out of the way when we write so that what we write ends up correctly lapidary and impersonal is alluring but fantastic. In her novel Democracy, Joan Didion compares the self to a hill seen by a geologist. Like the hill, the self is, quote, a transitional accommodation to stress. This is more like it. Which personality, which self depends on context, depends on the stressors of the moment, depends on how old we are, how lost we are, how bang on track. Each self tells the other selves a different story about where they are, where they've come from, where they're going, tries to incorporate those other selves into its version of the facts, and often fails, perhaps always fails. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. We tell ourselves stories in order to write. These stories work until they don't. One of my stories is about Rathcool. It goes like this. I am not from Rathcool. I am a different kind of person entirely. For most of my life, my various writing selves have collectively understood Rathcool as not so much a place as a trap from which I needed to be rescued. And since nobody else has ever seemed likely to attempt this rescue, I've had to do it myself. I did it by trying to become a writer. I did become a writer, but I have not rescued myself. 
Nobody ever does. I don't like mystical generalities about writing. How do you write? Answering this question, writers become, the writer becomes an octopus spewing clouds of defensive ink. Message to writing self, be concrete, be useful. Now that I'm in my 40s, I can see that my life has the classic shape of a writer's life. I grew up in a place that nobody has ever heard of. I got out via the traditional escape route of university education. I half killed myself learning to write. I began to publish. I made a niche for myself in the intellectual class, call it that. It took me a long time to stop thinking of the intellectual class as glamorous because the intellectual class was, I unconsciously believed, the thing that had saved me from my origins. Many other members of this class, having made the same journey, have also invested heavily in the idea that the intellectual class is glamorous. Writers, academics, intellectuals, artists, journalists, we are all often, in a sense, self-made. We have all fashioned ourselves against the background of origins we perceive to be drab, provincial, moribund. Hence, there is often a fevered quality to our activities. We rush around, we hustle, we are driven. What drives us? The nothingness we came from, or so we put it, consciously or unconsciously, to ourselves. All of this is a story I tell myself. I was born in the wrong place and had to find my way to the right place. The stories we tell ourselves tend not to fit the facts precisely. They tend to make use of the facts, not disinterestedly. The stories we tell ourselves operate in our favor. A more accurate account of my life would sound different. It might sound like this. I was born in a small town that was safe, quiet, obscure, and inhabited for the most part by decent people. I was a sensitive kid. I suffered from childhood asthma, so I spent a lot of time at home in bed. I found refuge and distraction in books and began unconsciously to conceive of books as a serious improvement on life. Aged eight or nine, reading Roald Dahl's Going Solo, it occurred to me for the first time that books were written and that you could therefore be a writer. This sounded to me like an excellent job, much better than the drab jobs done by the actual adults that I knew. Age 12, I began to write stories. I began with a story, <laughs> my mother dug this up recently, a story about a haunted bed and breakfast. It was called The 13th Floor, so that was a hell of a bed and breakfast. Therefore, somewhere along the line, I began to think of myself as destined to be a writer. I used this feeling of destiny to shield myself against some of the harsher aspects of growing up. I discounted Rathcool in toto because as far as I could tell, nobody else there read the books I read, nobody else there wanted to be a writer. I muddled my way through school, usually feeling lonely and bored, and soothed my loneliness and boredom with books, and with the inner conviction that being a writer was the thing that would save me from my fears and follies. When I did become a writer, I found that it had not saved me from my fears and follies, and that further crises beckoned. Now that I'm older, I can see that the actual history of my life is not remotely unusual. In fact, it illustrates a sort of general principle. This is the principle I'm going to call, borrowing from two writers I greatly admire, Robert Aikman and John Clute, the attempted rescue. This is the principle that has helped me understand not just my life, but writing, the thing that I've spent my life doing. Like all such principles, it is itself a story, which means that I should handle it carefully and not mistake it for a permanent truth. When I was younger and unpublished, I used to think that writers were special, that being a writer not just conferred, but revealed a greater than ordinarily human moral and spiritual importance, that writers, by virtue of being writers, were simply better people than everyone else. This is an idea that can survive contact with a lot of books, but which cannot survive contact with a lot of writers. We all know writers who imagine that they are, in fact, of greater than ordinarily human moral and spiritual importance. They tend not to be good writers or, incidentally, good people. But if you expect writers to be good people, then you have not met a lot of people. The moral and spiritual importance idea tends to be very important to writers, even to the most cynical and self-knowing writers. That's because it's part of their attempted rescue. The attempted rescue 
is the title of the first volume of Robert Aikman's autobiography. It was published in 1966. The second volume is called The River Runs Uphill, and it is, as a colleague of mine remarked recently, mostly to do with inland waterways. This is because Robert Aikman was co-founder of the British Inland Waterways Association, an organization dedicated to supporting and regenerating Britain's canals and rivers. He was also, of course, a writer. He died in 1981, the year I was born, without ever becoming famous, though he never sank entirely into obscurity either. His genre was the ghost story, though he preferred to call the long fictions he wrote strange stories. Strange they are. In The Swords, an Aikman story from his collection Cold Hand in Mine from 1975, a young traveling salesman arrives in dreary provincial Wolverhampton and stumbles upon a bizarre circus act in which a woman is stabbed bloodlessly by swords wielded by volunteers from the audience. The swords leave no wounds behind. Later, the traveling salesman runs into the woman and her manager at a cafe. It becomes clear that the manager is really a pimp and that the woman is for sale. The necessary transaction having taken place, she arrives that evening at the seedy boarding house where the traveler is staying. The traveler is a virgin. The woman undresses in the dark. They get into bed. The man finds himself holding the woman's hand, but it is separate from her body. I had pulled her left hand and wrist right off. Whatever she is, she is not human. The traveler ejects her from his room. He tells us this story retrospectively from old age in tones of nostalgia and regret. The sense of profound unease generated by this story is only partly to do with the enigma of the woman's nature. It is also to do with the traveler's untrustworthiness as a teller of his own tale. Did he really meet the woman and her pimp in the cafe by accident? The story is hazy on that point. Did he follow them there? Did he know in some sense from the very beginning what the woman was? His misogyny runs through the story like an ugly, dark seam. Also, his brutish insensitivity, although he calls himself early on in the story a mother's boy. Quote, after the first six women, say, or seven or eight, the rest come much of a muchness, is the sort of remark he makes. The Swords is the sort of story told by a man who is justifying himself to himself and to us though he doesn't really know that. He imagines that he is merely relating a strange event from his youth, but really he is trying to rescue the young man he was using devious means. And we are unsettled, as we always are when someone begins to tell us a story about themselves that we feel, or begin to feel, isn't true, or that hides the truth, or that bends reality into a pattern of brittle, expedient shapes. But we all tell such stories about ourselves, about our pasts. Speaking to ourselves about ourselves, we are the more deceived, willingly, needfully, until we aren't. If becoming a writer has for many years meant to me something like escape from mundanity and boredom into a special glamorous world, actually being a writer has been largely a matter of suffering periodic depressions and struggling free of them only when I figured out what story I was telling myself and why it was no longer working. One of the big ones being, becoming a writer will help you escape into a special, glamorous world. I am in the midst of another iteration of this process right now, another excavation, another act of literary criticism performed upon the self. That is why this lecture feels to me, I admit it, like a mess and why it is held together, if it is held together at all, largely by my hope that I am on to something, something useful to me, something useful to you. I first encountered the title of Aikman's autobiography in a book by the great science fiction critic John Clute called The Darkening Garden, published in 2006. The Darkening Garden is a book about horror, the genre, not the affect, though they are, of course, indissoluble. Clute attempts to codify horror according to a series of story shapes or story moves. Clute is Canadian, and he draws on the work of that other great Canadian critical codifier, Northrop Fry. For instance, according to Clute, every horror tale can be mapped according to a four-part model, sighting, thickening, revel, and aftermath. Sighting describes the moment early in a horror tale 
when the rind of the ordinary first peels away like the skin of an orange, revealing a glimpse of the pith of the world, which is horror. The figure in the window who shouldn't be there, the cellar door that should not be open. I won't go into definitions of Clute's other terms, but I recommend the darkening garden to interested parties. The Darkening Garden is subtitled A Short Lexicon of Horror, and it consists of a series of brief essays, really draft entries for an encyclopedia of horror that Clute has not yet written, defining Clute's key terms. One of these entries is headed Attempted Rescues. Attempted Rescue, excuse me. And it begins thusly, quote, The first volume of Robert Aikman's autobiography is entitled The Attempted Rescue. As he describes his formative years in this volume, the course of his life, and by extension, the course of human life in general, could be described as an attempt to rescue oneself from the iron cage of circumstance and destiny and gene, from family, disabling inheritance, accident, destiny, mortality, to make one's adult self into a kind of vessel capable of floating free of these iron circumstances. Attempted rescue is a shorthand for any understanding of the personality structure of the mature human being, which conceives of that structure as being guardedly recuperative of past stages of the self and of the unconscious. Even the most successful self is only an attempted rescue. Throughout Robert Aikman's fiction, these escape attempts are futile. So Clute's example of a classic attempted rescue tale is not one of Aikman's, though they all fit the bill. It's instead the story of the appointment in Samara, which comes down to us through the Babylonian Talmud. But here it is as retold in 1933 by Somerset Maugham. There was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to market to buy provisions, and in a little while the servant came back, white and trembling, and said, Master, just now when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when I turned, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Now lend me your horse, said the master, and I will ride away from this city and avoid my fate. Death tells the servant, I'm coming for your master. I will go to Samara, and there death will not find me. So the merchant lent him his horse, and the servant mounted it. Sorry, the ser death is coming for the servant. My apologies. And he dug his spurs in its flank, and as fast as the horse could gallop, he went. Then the merchant went down to the marketplace, and he saw me standing in the crowd, death. And he came to me and said, why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? That was not a threatening gesture, death says. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. This story encodes a familiar psychological dynamic. Fleeing what we fear, we end up running towards it. The merchant attempts his rescue. He runs in the direction of his death. I want to adapt this dynamic slightly to suggest that the thing that we use to rescue ourselves from the iron cage of circumstance and destiny and gene tends itself to become a trap. That in telling a powerful story that saves us from our origins, we sooner or later find ourselves imprisoned in the new story. And from this, we need to liberate ourselves in turn. It's a dialectic that would appear to pursue us unto death, hence the moral of appointment in Samara. But until we die, the possibility of growth persists. Clute's figuration of the attempted rescue appears pessimistic. He says even the most successful self is only an attempted rescue. But there is hope here. We can, Clute says, conceive of the personality structure of the mature human being as guardedly recuperative of past stages of the self and of the unconscious. With care, we can examine our past selves, that teeming multitude. Some of them may still have messages for us. Some of them may still be us. But handle them with care, these importunate, frightened, wounded, vulnerable, former selves. You were not necessarily wrong to think that they needed rescue or that the things they needed to be rescued from had real teeth, real claws. So I might as well be honest with you now. In negotiating a self with which to write this lecture, I have mostly failed. This fragmentary form, and you can see it's made up of separate paragraphs, is one accommodation with that failure. Digging up personal material, speaking about my own 
attempted rescues, I found that I didn't know how to put them on the page. Out of which inner materials might this new writing self be fashioned? Whom do I ventriloquize, borrow from? Am I the lonely, bewildered Kevin who grew up in Rathcool, or am I <laughs> the sophisticated cosmopolitan urban intellectual that I think I've built to replace him? Am I some equipoisal compromise? That built self, that's the guy who usually writes my essays. Some version of him, anyway. But as soon as I began this essay by talking about Rathcool, I, it seemed to me that that built self had been patched together with duct tape and paper clips that it wouldn't stand anymore. Not now, not for this. I had put them together out of being clever, being informed, or, or seeming clever, seeming informed. It was a confidence trick played on myself. So who's writing this essay? I don't know. Hence, fragments, repeated attempts. I know fragments are cool right now, or they were a couple of years ago, but there's nothing I can do about that. We sit down to begin a story, but a story has also brought us to that moment. I am or will be a writer. Writing this story will rescue me from mundanity. Writing this story will make my life worthwhile. Writing this story will make people admire me. Writing this story will help me to silence the voice of the wound. What story brought me to write this lecture? It went something like, well, I'm a teacher of creative writing. Of course, I have wisdom to impart. That story is very useful to me in my day job but it tends to elide my many doubts about the wisdom that I have supposedly gathered. After almost two decades as a published writer, my first short story appeared in The Stinging Fly in 2004, Declan mentioned. I was still living in Rathcool at the time, and that letter from Declan Mead accepting the story, it seemed like a promise that my attempt to rescue myself from my origins might succeed after all. But what do I know really? My treasured scraps of lore what if every one of them is wrong? There are writers, excellent writers, who break every rule that I cleave to. Why listen to me? In order to write this lecture, I've also been telling myself another story, which goes like this. Look at the other writers who've spoken in this lecture series. Real writers. Look at their essays. Real essays. If I join them, I too will be a real writer. This is a useful story up to a point, but it tends to elide the question of why I still so desperately need to think of myself as a real writer, whatever that is, after 18 years of publishing. But I've gone wrong again. There is no writing self. There are writing selves. A new one I sometimes think for each story, each essay, each book, each one a trans transitional accommodation to stress, each one an attempted rescue. I've sometimes wondered why my first published novel isn't an autobiographical first novel. Bad Day in Black Rock describes a world that I didn't grow up in, recounts experiences broadly that were not my own. To the extent that it does describe my own experiences, these have been disguised, attributed to characters who are not especially like me. I seem to have found it psychologically necessary not to write about Rathcool when I was in my 20s. Although now that I say this, I remember that this isn't Strictly true, I did, in my early 20s, write perhaps 100,000 words of a chaotic novel, I've got novel in inverted commas here, set in a small town and encoding some events that had happened to me. But in this manuscript, I relocated Rathcool. I changed its nature to make it more dramatic, more romantic. I gave it the things it seemed to me to need, a lake, a mysterious pine forest, a secondary school located in an ancient abbey, mysteries, murders, a hint of the supernatural. And again, before I wrote Bad Day in Black Rock, I wrote a more realistic novel that lightly fictionalized some of my own experiences. But again, I changed the setting to South Dublin. And I added a political conspiracy, a marital affair, more romance, more glamour. Three novels, none of them about Rathcool. I think this is because I was undertaking an attempted rescue. If I was to be a writer, I would not be a writer who wrote about Rathcool. So determined was I not to be trapped by that ordinary place. What I became instead was a writer trapped into a significant silence about the people and places that shaped me in my earliest years. 
Then again, it strikes me as important that almost the first thing I did when my first novel was published in October 2008 was move back in with my parents, that is, move back to Rathcool. The proximate reason for the move was that I was broke. The actual reason had to do with fright. My rescue attempt had worked. It had worked too well. I was a writer, but now what? Perhaps the old neighborhood hadn't been so bad. I knew it, after all. It was mine. How difficult I have always found it to acknowledge that fact. But it haunts the margins of every story I've ever told myself, every story I've ever written. My two published novels, most of the time I am proud of them. They are me, or part of me. But they also seem barely to have touched the surface of my experience myself. They are carefully made, as any vessel must be which is designed to sail free of iron circumstances. But now when I think about, think about them, all I can see is what they leave out. In her excellent short study of the critical afterlives of Willa Cather, Joan Casella writes about Cather's long apprenticeship Quote, she had to pare down, the hardest thing for a young artist to do. She also had to figure out what she was paring down to. I made a note of this sentence when I read it recently because it seemed precisely to describe my own immediate problem as a writer. Paring down to what? After two novels, I'm still figuring that out. I must lie down where all the ladders start, isn't that it? Lately, my daughter has been watching the Australian kids' TV show Bluey, she has become enamored of a specific line of dialogue delivered by one of the child characters in the show. She walks around the house shouting, Dad knows nothing. Dad knows nothing. She's right. I know nothing. Or perhaps I know one thing, which is that what I need to do now is rescue myself from all my old attempts at rescue. On the other hand, in almost two decades of being a published writer, I have learned a few things. I'm supposed in this lecture to talk about craft, and so far I haven't really, or not directly anyway. So while I'm here, and while you're here, some rules that I've found useful over the years. They're not all useful all the time. You can pick and choose. Building your vessel, you use what's to hand. The point is to sail, not to follow the rules of construction. So think about what you're writing before you start writing it. The notebook is not just a rescue vessel, it's also a workshop. Try to see what's really there. Try to see what things are really like. Take your feelings out of it. Some famous writers are guilty of imprecise observation at points. First line of Beloved by Toni Morrison goes, one, two, four was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. Rhetorically impressive first line, but babies are not spiteful or venomous. That's, these are emotions proper to older children, adults. The first duty of prose, said Robert Louis Stevenson, is to please the supersensual ear. So, careful attention should be paid to assonance, rhyme, half rhyme, echo. The paragraph is an exclusive club. Words of more than one syllable get in once only. Sounds get in once only. You can't have wondering if you've already got wandering. If you've already got spiteful, you are prohibited from using full until at least the following paragraph. Sometimes ugly prose is appropriate. Sometimes ugly prose is the point, but you need to know the difference. Sometimes cliche is appropriate. Sometimes cliche is the point, but you need to know the difference. Nobody else will care about any of this. Hardly anyone can tell the difference between good prose and bad prose anyway. And most people love cliches, but you are an artist. You are morally obliged to know the difference between good prose and bad, between cliche and fresh seeing. You're also morally obliged to see things clearly. Whence does this moral imperative derive? From the knowledge that error and illusion impede clarity, and therefore jam the tran transmission of emotional truth. Most people are operating most of the time with substandard equipment, intellectual, perceptual, emotional, moral. The novelist, artist is often no different. Why should they escape the common fate? But the true artist is the person who while they are making art, while they are writing, strives to work with the best equipment possible. By the best equipment possible, I mean not just vision, but revision. Peter Jackson, film director, said, the longer you work on something, the better it gets. Claire Keegan, I once heard Claire Keegan say, if a manuscript could talk, it would say, 
You left me when I needed you most. You will look back at your old work and see only flaws. This is because you have since bought better equipment. How have you paid for this better equipment? With work. Usually the work of revision, but also the work of reading. The artist, says John Gardner, in his book on moral fiction, has, quote, special machinery for seeing and feeling the tradition of his or her art. You must therefore know the tradition, or as much of it as you can absorb, but tradition is an elastic notion. You make your own. Gute, never hurry, never rest. Rilke, il faut travailler, rien que travailler. One must work, nothing but work. Or as the composer Janicek puts it in Brian Friel's late play performances, everything has got to be ancillary to the work. But will, I'm oh sorry, I've skipped one. Eric Fromm, now unfashionable left-wing cultural critic, once said the first condition for more than mediocre achievement in any field, including the art of living, is to will one thing. That's fine, but will is work shy, easily discouraged. Depression vanquishes will, exhaustion curbs it, crisis corrals its energies. On certain mornings to will one thing might take you as far as your first cup of coffee. So you trick yourself. You open your Word document or your notebook and you say, I'm gonna change that comma into a semicolon and that's all I'm going to do today. Change the comma into a semicolon. Uh, the sentence needs one more little nudge, the rhythm is off, you need to fix that, so you tinker. Now the other surrounding sentences aren't quite right, so you tinker with them. Before you know it, you're writing. <laughs> this works, this is how I start every day. <laughs> Making something is the point. Being successful should not be the point, but we're all only human. The publishing industry is mostly run by honorable people who love books and they want your book to do well. The film industry has some honorable people in it, but the thing to remember about film people is that they don't have any ideas and they're obsessed with people who do. Be careful what you sign. <laughs> Get an accountant. Learn to do a tax return. There's no way to avoid measuring yourself against your contemporaries. Some of them will be much more successful than you are. Some of them will write better than you do. The thing to ask about these contemporaries is, yes, but are they happy? Editors are usually right. Sub-editors are always wrong. Sometimes people will email you to say how much they liked your book or your story. You should always reply to these emails. Sometimes people will write bad reviews of your book on Amazon or Goodreads. These people are, without exception, too stupid to have understood what you were doing. It's a good idea to try reviewing some books. You might discover a taste for it. At the very least, it will teach you how seriously you should take reviews of your own books. If you review enough books, the exercise will sooner or later teach you that a critic's taste is partly learned and partly a function of personal pathology. Style two may be the outward dress of inner pain. The critic also is attempting self-rescue. Writers sometimes claim that they don't read reviews of their books. Anyone who says this is lying. As you get older, you change. I used to be obsessed with style as performance, flash and dazzle. Young writers, particularly young male writers, often put on style like a suit of armor, the writer as knight. The maiden he's rescuing is, of course, himself. Now I try to think of style as the utterances of a clarified mind. These changes have to do, I hope, with a degree of self-acceptance, of guarded recuperation, in John Clute's phrase. If my style ends up being simple, well, my younger self will be horrified, but maybe I'm, I'm simple, simpler than I used to think, and perhaps Cautiously, I can embrace that simplicity. There will always be people who are more intelligent than you are. There will always be people who are better informed than you are, who work harder than you do, who are more politically savvy than you are, who have published in fancier or more exclusive venues than you have. You will feel envious of and condescended to by these people. The thing to remember about them is that they are as harassed by competitive spite as you are. Not writing well, but Writing truly is the best revenge. Success is a trap. You'll need to rescue yourself from it. Failure is a trap too. Your rescue attempts will fail. They will be partial. The place you want to occupy for as long as you can is what Homer Simpson once called the creamy middle. 
This is the place that affords you the greatest freedom as an artist, if not as a human being. It is the place from which you least urgently require rescue. Seeing things as they are is the work of a lifetime. The tragedy is that we once did this undistorted seeing all the time. In Saul Bellow's short story, The Old System, the protagonist, Dr. Brown, opens a fresh can of coffee in the morning. Bellow tells us that Dr. Brown, quote, much enjoyed the fragrance from the punctured can, only an instant, but not to be missed. We all knew things like this as children. The artist tries to know them again, know them truly. All art aims at emotional truth. Therefore, all craft rules can be discarded in the name of emotional truth. Your job is not to follow the rules. Your job is to make something that works. On the other hand, I have one more craft rule. For Christ's sake, tell people where and when your story is taking place and do it sooner rather than later. No characters talking in a vacuum. And one more craft rule while I'm at it. Write in scenes. First, work out what constitutes a scene according to you. Two working definitions, something changes or someone tries to get something from someone else or from themselves. Sometimes you will look at your books and think, I made these, they're mine. They contain myself or some of myself, I hope the best of myself. How magical. Other times you look at your books and think, I'm stuck with them just as I'm stuck with my miserable trivial self, this pile of pointless print. Is that me, is that it? Both of these feelings are true and neither of them are true. Look to the next thing. Don't get stuck worrying about what you've already done. Ask not just what story am I telling, but what story brought me to this sentence, this paragraph, this page? Am I stuck not because my manuscript is faulty, but because I'm telling the wrong story about why I'm writing in the first place? I once interviewed Patrick McCabe and he offered, me, he offered his advice about writer's block. To say you have writer's block, he said, is to fall prey to the romance of disintegration. To go around saying you can't write is to engage in the activity that the gossip website Gawker in its former and more entertainingly scurrilous incarnation called writering. Sitting in Starbucks with your laptop, Instagramming pictures of your manuscript. Try not to be a writer. Recall what Sam Goldwyn once supposedly yelled into the screenwriter's office at MGM when he passed the door and heard no typewriters clacking, a writer should write. Yes, even if it's garbage, even if it's going to destroy your family, yes, even if it's going to end your marriage. You don't have to publish it, after all. You don't even have to write it. This is the real secret. There are other ways to rescue yourself. Money, sex, drugs, hobbies, scientific research. Writing is one way. Like all the others, it too is a trap. Of course, you might not think you stand in need of rescue, to which I say, that's a nice story you're telling yourself. Here, listen to mine. I must lie down where all the ladders start. I reread The Circus Animal's Desertion recently and saw for the first time that it is a poem about impotence, now that my ladder's gone. Poor old Yates. But the poem's point about art and origins stands up, if you'll pardon the pun. If maturity involves a guarded recuperation of past stages of the self, this surely is why maturity is so difficult, so painful. I am not just my built self, I'm also my given self. Which is the writer? Both and neither. The writer is made afresh with every sentence. When we write, we are also reading, reading a map in half darkness, in a foreign language. We cannot find our way except by patience, and guesswork and luck. Where are we going? The rag and bone shop, of course. Where else? Maybe the point is I need to write about Rathcool somehow. To break the brittle shell of the cosmopolitan literature and sift carefully through the fragments, recuperate guardedly what the shell protected. Maybe I can start right now, here, on this page, in this paragraph. Don't start with the macro view. Start with the small thing, the incidental. Every attempted rescue Start small. Say, start with the great jubilant bedraggled fuchsia bush that grows in the back garden of my parents' house. When we visit now, my daughter picks the blossoms, intricate, vul vulgar, beautiful purple flowers, and stirs them in a bucket with water to make perfume. I used to pick them as a child myself, bursting the unripened pods to see the little antennae within. This fuchsia bush was planted 
the year I was born. And it's been there, growing, thriving, in the exact same spot in my parents' garden in Rathcool ever since. Thank you.